We're going to start by telling you a little bit of the story of where we are at Unbound Ed and our own personal journey. We decided, I don't know, months and months ago to try to become a learning organization around diversity, equity, inclusion, bias, prejudice, and, and its influence on, on what is going on in our schools. And we've had stops, and we've had starts, and we've had pain, sorrow, joy, relief. Um, and so we wanted, we wanted to set today up with kind of, if, if you haven't gone on those journeys in your own organizations, your, your teams, your departments, your schools, your districts, if you've attempted it, um, I know there are people in here from my former district, Montgomery County Public Schools, Maryland, that um, the whole organization, the whole district took some of this stuff on. So there are parts that are familiar to those um, folks in here, and maybe others here also. But we wanted to share our, both share our organizational learning journey to date with you, and then move into talking about um, how this shows up. We have, a, we have a toolkit we want to share with you. We're starting to build a toolkit that can help you, which is what you see here on the slide. Um, where we are able to start pushing activities and resources out just as we do all of our other um, resources for you. So um, what we have, you want to talk about the toolkit, Lace, because you've been more intimately involved in it. Probably as we go through. Okay, so look for this little icon. Isn't it cute? This is our cute little icon to show you, like, if you see that on the slide, this will be something that is directly in the toolkit that we have started building and is now up on our website. Yes. At Unbound Ed, we just recently finished some core values. There are a lot of words on this slide. You can see that we have the categories of equity, courage, learning orientation, educator-centered design, which is what you've experienced this week. Actually, I hope you've experienced all these this week. Authentic engagement and wellness. These are our internal uh, core values, but what we wanted to show you are the core values that we think in many ways you've experienced this week, this week to understand our rationale for why we are talking about this in the way that we are. And the first one here you see is equity. We as a group, as an organization, we want to show up for you, for each other, in a way that commits to disrupting implicit bias, privilege, and racism in ourselves, in our organization, and in the education field. So we hope that we're bringing our core values to everything we do, and I, I know you felt that this week, so that's, this is where it's coming from, as well as the, just our mission. In terms of our value around courage, we demand excellence of ourselves, our work, our partners, and each other by challenging our mindsets and actions, yeah. embracing discomfort. I can't tell you how often um, I have to lean into the, the bias and privilege of my whiteness, my upbringing. The, the, if you, raise your hand if you came to see the movie the other night just so I can get a, a read on the room. And that whole piece about how wealth is passed down from home ownership is exactly why I'm a home, homeowner now and didn't know that I, that was a privilege. I thought I earned it uh, until um, I watched that movie. So, but I'll tell you that if you embrace something like this value of courage, like we are trying to at Unbounded, it gets a lot easier because you, ha you surround yourselves in conversations around courage and with one another. So hopefully you have seen perfect, imperfect um, examples of us as an organization trying to exhibit courage so that we can stretch our thinking, examine our intentions and impact in the service of making us uh, better for the educators we serve, which, who are you? And finally, our learning orientation. This is, this is the other piece to this, that we're committed to constantly studying this and learning this and learning about it and the impact um, and how to learn others and learn ourselves around this. I know that's not really a good grammar, English people, but uh, it, it feels that right, that it's right to me. And take ownership. This is, even in this ending keynote on Friday after an exhausting and thrilling and confounding week of work, we'd ask you to take ownership in this session that we're about to have with you 
Um, as we share our learning, as we try to um, push you into new ways of thinking, take ownership for the part that you haven't yet gone to. So we'd ask you to join us in that core value because um, we're bringing you along on the learning journey. Kicking and screaming or all in. So that's part of what we wanted to share. Build that context for you. In our study, in our organization, raise your hand if you're familiar with Courageous Conversations by Glenn Singleton. Okay. This is a great resource, a great book. It has activities, it has things to read. And in our use of Courageous Conversations, we use um, the four agreements for Courageous Conversations. We're gonna ask you to interact a little bit today. And in those moments, we would ask for you to stay engaged in the conversations, to speak our truth with mercy. Lace, talk a little bit about speaking our truth with mercy. So I use this a lot and I borrowed this um, because it's okay to speak your truth, but it's important to speak your truth with mercy. And what I learned about mercy is that speaking your truth without mercy is like getting a root canal without anesthesia, right? But, and tr mercy without truth is like having a cheerleading squad without a team. And so we really lean on speaking our truth, honoring what's true for us, and saying it in a way that it offers up mercy to the listener. We try to practice these norms when we are in conversations about race and equity, um, bias, prejudice, all those things. And so please kind of lean on this. These are norms for us to use today. Experiencing discomfort, that's all different ranges depending on how comfortable you are with the topics. And that we must expect and accept that we will not reach closure. We'll spark things for you today and we cannot expect that we'll tie it all up in a nice little neat bow. So just be in that moment, be in that time with us. The other thing that uh, guides our conversations around, around uh, race and equity is that the Singleton and the Courageous Conversation, they have six conditions for having these conversations. And the, there are three we're gonna share with you. The first one, um, and we're gonna share with, because this is, this is part of our design of these conversations in the day. The first one is that you keep um, all the conversations, they, they are racial, local, and immediate. So speaking from the I, I feel. Not some people do this, not research says, but it's very much an I experience that you're having and you set up these conditions. We're gonna ask you to reflect on some things today and then speak from the I so that it's local, immediate, and personal. Another piece of, another condition is around that uh, the, that we've been talking about, especially if you're here for the movie on Wednesday night, about race being a social and political construction. And, um, and, it, it, and it functions within all these other systems. Yeah. So kind of keeping that in mind as a condition for having the conversation. And then the last one is about developing, um, being able to isolate race. Thank you. <laughs> I have a cheat sheet because <laughs> I just can never hold these in my hand. Isolating race from the other aspects of the, the things that can affect these conversations. It's not, it doesn't mean ignoring them. It means including it and pulling it out and not just avoiding it because it's hard to talk about. So those are some of the conditions and we have built those in to the, um, the questions we're gonna ask you, the, the things we're gonna share with you. And we just wanted you to know kind of why we're doing what we're doing. So we're going to do an activity here. This is in the toolkit. See the little icon? And it's called being inside and being outside. And you're going to need something to write on. Um, get a piece of paper out. There's a postcard on your chair, but we don't want you to use that. That's for the end. Cell so, phones count. Yes, yeah, cell phones count. Anything where you can jot down, because you're gonna be taking some moments to reflect. Now the setup for this uh, piece here so you can know what's coming. You're going to have some, we've got some guiding questions and provocative questions for you to think about and to write. And then uh, we'll ask you to share in small groups and we'd really love it if you turned and talked to people that you didn't know, because that's how we all um, expand our community and learn. And then there will be um, some, perhaps some time for sharing out, but there will be uh, 
You'll, you will be making public your thoughts. So the concept of being inside. Every one of us feels like an insider in different situations. We all have that experience where you are accept, you feel accepted, respected, you feel like you belong. So we'd like you to think about a situation in which you feel like an insider. What advantages or privileges do you enjoy? And if you earned anything to, if you, if you did anything to earn those advantages or privileges, that's going to be the one side of this coin. The other side is the converse. Think of a situation in which you are an outsider. You feel a lack of acceptance, respect, and feel that you do not belong. So what we'd like you to write down, put pen to paper, finger to keyboard, why do you feel like an outsider in that situation that you're describing? What are the disadvantages of being the outsider? And did you do anything to deserve those disadvantages? Let's go ahead and take, I'm gonna check and see where you guys are, right? Four minutes, I'll see if anybody needs more time at that point. So we're now gonna turn into, oh, I did wanna plug, it's in the toolkit. If this did something for you guys, you have it now, access to it. And um, let you have the pleasure of learning a little from Lacey now. Thank you, Kristen. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. <laughs> oh, they're clapping for you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we wanted to start with that exercise because oftentimes when we have these conversations, we don't take time out to examine how they begin to resonate inside of us. And so we wanted to take time out to think about being on the inside and being on the outside uh, before uh, we really dive into, well, what does that mean for our students? So I didn't come by today to uh, give you a whole bunch of graphs. Uh, I didn't come by today to really espouse a lot of reports. Um, I'm really channeling uh, my inner grandfather because my papa did a really good job of telling stories. And so I came by today to tell you a story in hopes that this story will make those data points and those reports come alive. And so today I came to tell you about educating Mitchell. You see, I've had the privilege in my life um, to be a part of a family, to be a part of a unit that we believe that it takes a whole village to raise a child. And I've had the privilege to uh, really place myself in the learning path of children, not just as a teacher, as an educator, but as an aunt, as a godmother, as a neighbor, as a church member. And as I began to take this journey, I started to see a pattern. And I started really jotting down this pattern and this pattern began to turn into a story. And so I dropped by today to tell you a little bit about that story. Is that okay? Okay. So this is Mitchell. I had the privilege of being in the room when Mitchell was born. His mother was elated. His father was excited. His grandparents were beside themselves. And we knew that Mitchell was special, like everyone believes that their kids are special. No matter how funny or weird they come out looking. <laughs> By the way, when Mitchell was born, I screamed, it's a frog! But what we began to notice about Mitchell very early on in his developmental stages is that it didn't matter what we put in front of him. Mitchell always found a way to roll himself to crawl himself towards books. And I loved it. He didn't want to just taste the books and chew on the books. He wanted to look at the pages and the words. He loved the way the colors fell across the page. And of course, having pictures like this, we went around to prove everyone that we had a genius. <laughs> I mean, he was nine months old when I took this picture. I propped him up in the bed, he rolled himself over, 
and started going through the book like a little old man reading his morning newspaper. And as Mitchell continued to develop, we noticed that he just had this thirst for learning. And so like all young children, we were excited to begin to tell Mitchell, you are going to, when you turn three, have an opportunity to enter into a building where all you do all day long is learn. And there will be other children around you who will be just as excited, not only to open up the books, but to count the beans, to notice the colors, to watch plants grow. And I gotta tell you, Mitchell was more excited his first day of pre-K than he was any Christmases or birthday thus far combined. And so we sent Mitchell to school and he was ready. And a couple of weeks later, Mitchell's mom, uh, Mitchell comes in the door, I have a note from the teacher. He was so excited because the note had smiley faces on it. And who doesn't like a smilogram? And so his mom, just as excited as Mitchell, thought, I'm gonna take what's ever in this note and frame it. Until she popped open the staples. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Rivers, today Mitchell was involved in an incident with another student in which he chose to throw a rock at a playmate who threw one at Mitchell first. Mitchell's behavior was erratic, disruptive, and aggressive to say the least. We would like to schedule a conference to discuss Mitchell's uncontrolled behavior. Mitchell's mother was devastated. I mean, sure, he's three. He has impulses. He's been around his cousins. They throw sand at him, he throws sand back. What do you mean he's disruptive, erratic? I had to tell Mitchell's mom the hard truth, that not African American boys make up 19% of preschoolers, but they hold 45% of suspensions. I said, suspensions, and that their counterpart, the girls, they make up 20% of female preschool enrollment, and they experience 54% of, of suspensions in preschool. See, Mitchell's parents got a harsh look at the reality of the disproportionality in discipline that starts with there are children in preschool. And that disproportionality, we don't have data that just talks about the students being suspended. We have data that tells us that when teachers are standing in front of those children and they're making in the moment decisions, that 42% of them say that a little black boy requires more attention. And that 13% of white girls don't, and that quite frankly, they don't really show any challenging behaviors. Three years old. See, Mitchell's parents were elated. They were so excited that he was gonna get the moment to go to school and become a lifelong learner. A Couple of days later, I heard the excitement fall out of her voice when I received a phone call. I'm sorry, it should not be allowed. He's only three years old. But is this implicit bias at work? What, what are the consequences for, for children, for my child? The consequence is he will soon realize that the world does not see him as we do. And, and what are the solutions? The solution is the undoing of bias and racism. See, what Mitchell's parents were butting up against is really something that we all innately have in us, and that is unconscious bias. It's the automatic, unconscious stereotype that drive us to behave and make decisions in a certain way. 
And I gotta be honest, reports, data shows us that that unconscious bias continuously gets built around media, around our perceptions, around being inclusive, not going out of our neighborhoods, being comfortable. We all carry it. Bias lives in all of us. There is no escaping it. It's really, some research with, researchers would tell us, something that is innate, that was there with first man. It's how we determined whether or not we were going to survive. But really, it's not just bias at play, it's also prejudice. I want you to read this statement and turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor what this statement resonates for you. See, for some of us, we hear this word, we read it in the newspaper, but we oftentimes don't stop and think about its definition. And we certainly oftentimes don't think about how bias and prejudice come into play and how really they equal the fallout of marginalized conditions for students and that these marginalized conditions enter into our schoolhouses, our communities, our rules and regulations of how we conduct our everyday lives. But you know, I gotta tell you that Mitchell being raised in a family um, of African-American, of people of color, we know that this is something that he was gonna meet one day. And we still Vaseline him up, put his clothes on, put his backpack on, walked him to the bus, because we knew that it was essential for him to get an education like everyone else. And so when that moment happened to Mitchell and his mom and his family in preschool, it changed the trajectory of his learning. It shifted the trust that his parents had in a system that if I send my kid to your building, you will honor and love him as I do. And quite frankly, it began to dim Mitchell's light. But you know, I gotta tell you, we all stand on the, pre the, uh, the uh, preface in my family that you just keep on keeping on. And so we really loved on Mitchell. We read him books. We encouraged him that you're gonna keep going in spite of. We hugged on him. We kissed him. We held him. And we let him know that he should be proud of who he was despite what other people saw in him. Because we knew we had no choice. Elementary school was coming. We knew that he was going to enter into a building where bias is reinforced. That when people begin to learn stereotypes and prejudice, they resist change. Even when there's evidence there that fails to support it or points out that what you so believe just isn't true. Or you get folks who try to say, I, that's not me. I'm not biased. I'm not prejudiced. My neighbor's black. <laughs> so we, Mitchell began elementary school, light a little bit dimmer. He was still excited about math and science. But we began to notice things, that there was a wax and wane in his love of education. At home, Mitchell still wanted to help dad plant the garden and figure out how many bags of soil go in a 12 by 12 space. He still wanted to follow mommy to the grocery store and figure out if mommy has $100 to spend on groceries, how much money can she really spend so that Mitchell has $7.50 to go to the dollar store. He wanted to know why certain flowers grew the way they grew and what was it in fact that the bees picked up and moved from flower to flower and why were bees so attracted to some flowers and couldn't stand others. At home, he was a lifelong learner. Unfortunately, at school, it didn't fall out the same way. 
His parents received notes that said, Mitchell is not focused. He has no interest in topics. He is often distracted. He has to be redirected. And he seems uninterested. What? And Mitchell's parents began to receive every 60 to 90 days notices from the school that said, we really think Mitchell should be evaluated. And so I asked, they came to me and said, could you be Mitchell's advocate? Because we don't trust where we're sending him. We don't trust what they're saying. And we don't even know how to speak to what they're saying. So before we went to the student services meeting, I asked the school, can I see your data? I wasn't shocked. Mitchell's counterparts were showing data that we see across the United States in reading. And in math. And so Mitchell's parents went to meeting after meeting and just gave up and decided, you know what, that's fine, test him. They dressed Mitchell up that day, fed him a big breakfast. He walks into the school, sits down with a brand new counselor that's at the school, and he begins to become evaluated. Three weeks later, test results come back, and lo and behold, Mitchell actually qualified for the gifted and talented program. However, it was October and his parents were told it was too late for him to start. And once again, Mitchell became the stat that 66% less children that are African American are less likely to be assigned to gifted education services. Really, Mitchell's educators were what Kate described in her opening keynote, feeding into a system that was designed to do what it was doing. Mitchell's educators were using lens that is developed systematically by just being a part of our society. See, our lens is developed by legacies, and we had an opportunity on Wednesday night to unpack the legacy of institutionalized racism as it means in housing. But there are legacies that we have in the United States that feed into our biases and our stereotypes. And along with those legacies are layers. And these layers have to do with who we are. Are you single? Are you married? What's your social economic status? What nationality are you? What political values do you hold? But those legacies and layers then begin to help shape the lens that we have to see each other every day. And unfortunately, some of those lenses are clouded by biases and stereotypes and prejudices. See, one of the lens is called the assimilation lens. And I have to tell you, my mother worked really hard with me and my sister with that assimilation lens. When in Rome, do as Rome, do as the Romans do. And I have to tell you that my mother on Sunday evenings made us sit at the table with our hands folded and we practiced proper English. Because see, she wasn't gonna send her little black girl to school and have anyone look at her and say, what's wrong with her? Oh, she wanted me to get my white woman talk down. And I have to tell you, I'm very proud. People call my house today and they have no idea what color I am when I pick up the phone. And they shouldn't even wonder. The other lens is the colorblind lens. I gotta tell you, I'm a date myself. We grew up in a time where we sang songs, it's cool to be you, it's cool to be me. If you look like me, if you sound like me, if you dress like me, if you wear your hair like me, and by the way, what's wrong with me? I don't want you to look at me and say, I don't even see that you're black. Really? <laughs> I 
I want you to see that I'm an African-American woman. I want you to look at Mitchell and see that he is an African-American young man. Because we are all born with our own beauty, our own uniqueness, and part of that beauty and uniqueness is a piece or who we are with our race and ethnicity. And the third lens that his teachers and educators and all of us sometimes hold is the mectocritus lens. And that's the cream that rises to the top. I gotta tell you, I'm gonna tell you what it really is. It's a book I got a year ago, it's grit. If you just get in there and grit it up, you're gonna make it. I got news for you, you can grit all you want, but if you walk into a school building as an African-American male, grit is not is what's gonna get you by. Oh, you can try, and I want you to try. But there are people who are gonna look at you and they don't care how gritty you are. And so these are the lens that Mitchell's teachers and people who worked in the building held and chose to see him through every day. It's also the lens we use when we look at data. See, I have a problem with all of us always putting up the data that shows about the black and Latino male, because you know what? After a while, we become voyeuristic with this data. It becomes just another blog post on Facebook, another tweet that goes across our phone. And sometimes we fail to stop and really think that it's not just the data that our kids are carrying on their backs, it's trying to earn the respect and to counter the stereotypes that are detrimental to marginalized students. So not only are you not uh, proficient, but now you have to go and prove every day that you are human. <laughs> the underlying theme is that schools must create a strong culture of achievement that culture must be able to counter the ideology of some students having intellectual incompetence. Schools must hold all students to the same high standards and that they should create an environment that positively affirms all students' identities. See me. That's what Mitchell needed, not just for his family to see him, but his bus driver, the crosswalk guard, the secretary at the, in the school, the lunch counter, male or female. See, what Mitchell's parents didn't understand is that he was entering into a system that by fourth grade, one out of seven African-American males were proficient in reading, and that by eighth grade, one out of 10 are proficient in science. But we push Mitchell, and every day he came home deflated, we pumped him back up. And somehow, some way, he made himself through elementary school, through middle school, and arrived in high school. And I spent all summer pumping Mitchell up with positive, motivational sayings, words. I, took, I made him watch documentaries. We went to museums. And every time we got together, I let him know that he was starting a new path in his life. The night before he started high school, he gives me a call. And he says, Auntie Lacey, I'm really excited. I do believe this is a new path. But what if the teachers see me like my middle school teachers saw me? And I very quietly, not really wanting to hear the answer, asked, how did they see you? And he replied, I couldn't do anything with those words. Quite frankly, there was nothing I could say to turn them around. The only thing I could do was to encourage him that he show up on the first day of school knowing who we believed and who we needed him to believe that he really was. And that despite what other people thought, how other people acted, that he had a village that was behind him and that was going to continue to love on him and push him and believe that he could achieve anything he wanted to believe. 
I gotta tell you, something miraculous happened for Mitchell. He walked in the building at that high school soon to discover that they had placed a brand new principal in the building. And Mr. Etienne came in with a tenure of being an educator, knowing that he needed to create an environment that was inclusive of all his students. See, Mr. Etienne had had past experiences working in buildings, working with his leadership team and his staff and getting them to understand around the biases and the stereotypes that we all carry into the building. Mr. Etienne understood that if you got a child that looked like Mitchell to graduate with an appropriate degree, that those African-American males make up 25% of our military that those males go on to protect our nation. And that if you gave those males an opportunity in school, that over one million of them entered into college and over 2.5 million of them got degrees. And you know what they did with those degrees? They became entrepreneurs. They started black owned businesses that actually surpassed the national average of entrepreneurship. And if you really fought past your bias and your stereotypes about African-American boys or young men that look like Mitchell, you understood that those households actually dedicate 25% more of their income to charity than the average household in the United States. Mr. ATN understood that all children African-American males, Latino males, African-American girls, Latino girls, Asian, Muslim, that all children who may not look like the staff that meets them every day needed to have an opportunity to strive in environments where standards were high, where instruction was precise, and most importantly, they were met at their grade level. And where the staff began to realize that what they may have walked in, the lenses they had in that building, needed to be adjusted. Because you see, once you pour into a community, that actually pours into a state, and that actually pours into our nation. Mr. Etienne understood that there was an escalator out of poverty that was really on the shoulders of the educators in his building. And so he, along with his leadership staff, really worked at positioning the young people to secure a high school diploma that was preparing them for post-secondary training and education and that created a clear pathway out of poverty. And Mr. Etienne charged his staff with understanding that student perceptions, that do you realize that black and white students have the same perception in sixth grade, and one year later, a couple of seasons later, that the black students' trust began to drop by seventh grade. And that when students don't have a trust in who they're meeting every day in their building, they're going to be cited for discipline and they'll be less likely to enroll in college. Then in order to achieve educational equity, he knew that he had to get his staff to address their own bias lens, and that they had to take a hard look at the way the assimilationist lens, the colorblind lens, and the metocritus lens was playing out in their policies and practices in their building. They began to lean on practices that they saw were working in schools with student populations that look a lot like theirs. There were personal opportunity plans that were developed for each student. They began collecting and reporting on quality data and data that was disaggregate, disaggregated by race and gender, and most importantly, data that gave accurate description of the different kinds of diplomas that, district, that the district offered. For you see, our graduation rate is increasing, but you have to stop and ask, what are they graduating with? He created new systems in his building that counteracted systemic racism, systems that upheld fellowship initiatives, broadened access to educational support, utilized hands-on mentoring, 
They had pre-college and intern support programs and international learning opportunities. And the biggest of all was that he held up a moratorium on suspension because there's got to be a better way of course correcting our children. And then Mr. Etienne asked his staff to lean on norms that, embrace, that they embraced and lived. We believe that all students of color, especially African-American and Latino young men, are assets to society and important members of the human family. We know that valuing all members of the human family is the most prosperous way forward in our diverse nation. We reject any narratives that denigrate people and prejudices them one against the other. And we are committed to working with others in asset-oriented ways to bring about a more caring and prosperous America. We will no longer serve our students dehumanizing practices and policies. We will serve our students policies and practices that we would want our own children to be offered up. So even though I told this tale, I came by today to tell you this tale about Mitchell, I really want us to understand that this isn't just about Mitchell. This is about all students who are marginalized on a daily basis. Carr, who was one of our facilitators, ran me over when she made this statement when we gathered together as a community. You say to a student, this is too hard for you. I will give you something easier. You say to another student, this is too easy for you. I'm going to give you something harder, and I bet you will ace it. One is a statement of negative bias. The other is a statement of positive bias. While positive bias can be motivating, it can also carry undue stress to many learners. For instance, there is an Asian stereotype that all Asians are good in math, and an A minus is an Asian F. We need to care for all our students under our charge. See, if we had not created a community where there was a diverse group of us coming together, there is no way I would have learned this. We have to be committed to break outside of our norms, to break outside what feels good to us, and begin to reach across and make friendships and companionships with folks who do not look like us. That is the only way to be able to do this work. That is the only way to ensure that our Mitchells will succeed. And so I ask you, who are your Mitchells? If you haven't stopped to consider it, I'm gonna ask that you do that. If you don't believe that they're there, I'm going to ask that you go back and take a harder look. Because there is a Mitchell in your district, in your buildings, in your classrooms, in your neighborhoods. And your Mitchell may not look like my Mitchell, but your Mitchell deserves, like all of us, a right to lifelong learning a right to pass something on to the generations that comes behind him, a right to give back to the community that has given to him. Right now in your seats are some postcards. I'm gonna ask that you take these two postcards and on one postcard, I want you to write a commitment. Your commitment should be focused on when you leave, how will you ensure that all students have an equalized trajectory of their learning path? Your second postcard is a commitment that you are going to identify the Mitchells in your community. And that you will garner interest and intrigue, that you will stir the pot, that you will upset some people so that they rise up, gather together, and stay committed to ensuring that all the Mitchells in your school have an equalized education. I'm gonna give you two minutes to work on your postcards, and then I'll pull us back together.
So when Lacey first told me the story of Mitchell, she took me through this whole concept. And all those slides about moves educators make that result in those marginalization data points and experiences. You know, it, um, I, did so many, I did so much of that. I did it in the name of high expectations. You know, so if you, if you have a, a discipline policy in your classroom, in your school, that's about holding the line, but it results in this, go back and change that. In your classroom, the, the, the things that you do that are about sorting kids and about having high expectations no matter what. I, I had kids that would want to come and make up work to get a better grade, but no, because they'd miss the deadline. Just think about those things. Now, when I look at what I did personally to marginalize children, you know, I, I know better so, you'll do so I can do better. And that's what this is about. Again, we have our toolkit as a resource. We are resources for you. We want you to carry this forward. And when you walk out the door, we hope a lot of this lives. Live up to that commitment that you just wrote to yourself and to your Mitchells on your postcard. Make that happen. And then when you come back for Pathway 2, come tell us about it. One more survey, people. One more survey. Please, please, please don't blow it off. You will be able to tell us feedback about your Friday experiences, and we need that. We use it, as well as this keynote. First time this has happened in this way. Um, but I want to, what I feel really is a privilege for me and for all of you is you got to learn from Lacey today the way she teaches me every day. Thank you very much.